Okay, folks. So, um, good evening and welcome to our second in the series of lamb crop. So tonight we are focusing on hill lambing um, and we're looking more so at maximising your lamb crop from the hard hill. Um, next week we'll go on to outdoor lambing and um, again our aims are very, very similar to last week in that we're looking to improve performance of flocks while also minimising lamb losses at lambing time. So we're going to cover quite a lot of different stuff as we did last week. So just a, a quick summary, there was so much discussed last week. We've got the recording that we can circulate around everybody now as well. We covered from using how to communicate to nutrition um, and everything in between. So again, tonight we've got a fantastic lineup for you. Um, I am your chair again this evening, Kirsten, um, and I'm SEC Consulting Beef and Sheep Consultant. We've got my colleague, Poppy Freiter, who's going to speak about nutrition. We've got um, Bobby Lennox, who is going to give us his practical side and how, how he actually operates his system and using genetics for reading success. And we were supposed to have Fiona join us. Unfortunately, she can't make it tonight. So we have a um, replacement in Professor Davy McCracken, who is a fantastic replacement for us to have this evening. So Poppy, I will maybe just hand over to you, if that's OK, um, and we'll just get started. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, hopefully that's sharing OK. Yes. Perfect. Great. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for having me tonight um, to talk about hill sheep nutrition uh, following on from last week. Um, just a bit of a recap, because the same principles do apply, obviously, but it's the practicalities that get a little bit more challenging in the hill environment. Um, but this, um, for those of you that weren't there last week, um, I, I love this poster. It's a QMS, U Nutrition and Body Condition Scoring Timeline. It's available online or in hard copy if you request it from QMS. But it goes through a lot of the detail of how to manage you through their pregnancy. So we're talking from 50 days pre-tupping right the way through to the weaning. So it gives you nice hints and tips in terms of the nutrition through their pregnancy. The same principles apply. Those golden 20 days, either side of tupping, is very influential to their scanning percentage. And the golden 35 days in the lead up to lambing is very influential to um, lamb survival. So those two key periods, if nothing else, are where the, the priorities must lie. Um, however, I will say this is more of a lowland upland poster. As you can see, we've got the condition score targets along the bottom, um, which are more of a lowland type target. And I'll go into the more hill targets in a moment. Um, you condition score fundamental to um, to the flock productivity to lamb survival um, always and like I say it just gets that bit more challenging to manage in the hill systems um, but you can see down the bottom here what sort of targets we're expecting to achieve when it comes to condition score in the hills so they're generally around half a condition score or a condition score lower than the the lowland targets and the main reason for that is because hill breeds carry a lot more of their fat internally. That's the main reason. But as I say to everybody, it's just a case of getting a hat, your hands on your use as much as possible to build up that uh, understanding, that scale of condition scores in your flock across the year to try and build up that scoring system that suits you and your staff. And it's all about feeling those horizontal processes, those short ribs, the five short ribs along the along the, the rump, and just feeling how how sharp they feel and how easily you can get your fingers underneath the ribs. And if you can get them underneath the ribs easily, then they're less than a condition score three. And if you can barely feel feel them, uh, which is probably not the case often for the hill views, but if you can barely hear the feel them, they're, they're quite fat. And um, more of a condition score four or five. So condition scoring absolutely still very fundamental to the success of these flocks. And there's lots of science. And, and I, I shared last week even the SIEC um, research, which showed getting them on target uh, had led to lower U mortality, for instance. Um, however, 
the challenge lies on the hill farm as to how to manage this. And I just thought I'd draw this sort of comparison. I often look at feed supply and demand on farm systems. And when I look at sort of my lowland upland type systems, this is what it looks like. So for a March lambing flock, um, you're looking at this sort of grass growth curve on average, I know it varies year to year, farm to farm, but you're looking at this sort of grass growth curve and um, this is the sort of uh, flock demand, okay? And, and you can see that um, various sort of wintering practices. So we talk about housing, we talk about forage crops, we talk about uh, rotation of grazing through the winter, feeding through the winter. They, they enable us to have a higher stocking rate and so able to have demand exceed supply through these months in terms of grass in order to utilize the summer growth. Fantastic. However, in the hill situation, um, it looks more like this down the bottom with a, a much often a much lower stocking rate. So this was um, one U to the acre, which speaking with uh, Bobby earlier is even still as higher than, um, than, than Bobby runs on his farm. And um, you can see that it's, and even with the, that grass growth adjusted for the hill type situation, you can see it's, it's quite challenging to utilize the grass in the hill situation on it during the summer months. And what you find is that um, through the winter months, if it's grass alone, then there's a lot more like out with your control. So depending on the conditions of the season, they might lose condition, gain condition, and, and there's less control, there's less ability to control in the hill situation. And then on top of that, if it's overgrazed during the winter months, this sort of spring production might shift more later to later on in the year because grass needs a leaf to grow more. So if we overgraze early on in the year, it's not gonna get away. And then later on in the year, you might end up with um, an excess of grass. And if it's undergrazed, then you lead to changes in the species composition away from those productive species to a less productive species. So you get the sort of knock on effect um, of lower grass production early on in the year because it could be overgrazed and then lower grass production later on in the season because it's not grazed optimally. Um, so winter opportunities, I've just put on, on the top here and, and I know they're not gonna be applicable um, um, to all systems, not going to be an option to all systems, but I just rather want to provoke thought into what's, what's an opportunity for yourselves. Deferred grazing can work well. It depends uh, perhaps on having a convenient block of land where you can exclude stock perhaps um, sort of within the summer months uh, for them to graze in the winter months if you want to have that stock of feed like a standing hay crop. Um, for the for the use to go on to during the, the winter months. Um, forage crops, I know that would require some more in by land, so it's not always viable, but forage crops can be a great way to move stock off the, the prime grazing land or off your, your grazing area and um, to give it that bit of rest, especially for the that spring production. Housing, I was struck yesterday, I was watching footage of Norwegian sheep and how efficient they were um, and they looked fantastic in the summer months uh, on you know slopes that competitive with ours um, on the west coast of Scotland and um, however a lot of those Norwegian systems actually do end up housing a bit during the winter which enables them to achieve that greater stocking rate to utilize more of this grass and keep it within that species composition that's more productive. Um, so, so housing, yes, it's expensive, but, um, and I'm not necessarily an advocate of it, but it does help achieve that greater utilization of the, the grass during the summer months. Um, away grazing, sometimes possible, less control. You might end up with them coming back um, in poorer condition. Fencing, I often talk about fencing, particularly on these lowland upland systems, but, and I appreciate it's challenging and hopefully there's technology further down the line to help us improve that, but fencing always returns in terms of improving that grazing control. Um, and then as many of you probably um, end up having to do is that bit feeding during these months. So it's about trying to not only utilize the summer production, but also control what we can control 
to get them onto those condition score targets um, through the winter months, so less is out with our control. And then another question I put to you is whether it's an option to wean that bit sooner, to give them that bit more of a dry period to get them onto their good condition score targets before the winter months. Um, so they're going into the winter in good condition. Um, I showed this graph last week. So it shows the ewe milk um, from lamb birth to 12 weeks. And you can see how, how sharply that starts to drop off from six weeks onwards. You can see the lamb intake exceeding the ewe milk supply from a, um, around the sort of three to four week mark. Okay. Um, and so this is taken from AHDV feeding the ewe. And based on research, the optimum lamb weaning age is 12 to 14 weeks old. So we have to estimate that at 13 and a half to 15 and a half weeks from the start of lambing. So I would encourage you to review if, if getting them on target condition is a challenge for yourselves, re review weaning to give them more opportunity to gain that bit of fat cover before the winter. Um, and again, just to recap the energy requirements um, of the use in the lead up to lambing time. So you can see the red line here is their full requirement. And then the green line here, probably less applicable to the hill systems, but those that um, are in too good a condition. And you can see the contributions of forage to that. So for instance, average hay will meet their energy demands right the way through till nearly eight weeks pre-lambing if they're in good condition. However, if they're not, it'll be 12, more like 12 weeks. So just seeing where it crosses the line. Um, good hay baled silage, probably more like nine weeks. Good silage, um, more like six weeks. And like I often say, graze grass, as long as there's some there and it's growing, it can, and, and user design to utilize this to meet their requirements, but you need to have sufficient of it. So often um, we will feed silage and hay, um, just some reminders and best practice. Um, a lot of the time when we are looking at supplementing their energy, we are trying to base this on what the energy is the forage supply in, then we'll meet that deficit with a concentrate. So that energy supply from forage is assuming they've got good access. Um, so it's important to remember that a, a ring feeder is only designed to feed 24 ewes. And some will say, right, but they don't all feed at once. But consider the, the bullshier and uh, more uh, bossy type ewes, they will get in there and they will eat good stuff and leave the shyer feeders to pick up the, the less, um, the poorer quality stuff. So, so having that space to make sure that all of them can get access at once is important. So making sure that um, 24, you're budgeting on 24 use per ring. Um, I've just done a quick calculation of, of what a crossbred you will, you will eat. So they'll normally eat about 1.2 uh, kilos dry matter per day. So if a bale of silage is 500 kilos dry matter, 35% uh, dry matter, that's 175 kilos. So those 24 that use will take six days to eat that. Um, and then also the, the silage does become less palatable after three days. So there will be that reduction in intake. So it's good to sort of sense check, sense check this, how well they're eating that forage. And um, is it lasting longer than that? Then that's indicative they're not quite getting their intakes. Um, I put some pictures here from a farm I was recently on of some customized feeders that he developed um, to to prevent the ewes jumping up on the hay. Um, and also they sort of come in at the sides as they eat. So get greater utilization, less wastage. Um, it might spark ideas, might be helpful to some. And then obviously the, the other option is to feed on the ground and that will be good for their intakes. All of the, they'll all get access, but it's poorer for wastage. So it's a bit of a balancing act there. Um, and then some might get a silage analysis done. Uh, if you are feeding silage, I recommend that you do because it, the uh, quality of silage is highly variable. Um, and it will give us an understanding as to how long that silage will meet their energy requirements into their pregnancy. 
So I've got two examples here. Um, and the thing that I'm drawn to first on a silage analysis is this value, the ME, the metabolizable energy. So I can see silage one is 10.7 ME and silage two is nine and a half. So straight away, I'm starting to um, have my favorite silage analysis on the left-hand side here. Crude protein, I will check, sense check as well. So I can see, yeah, this one's got slightly lower crude protein value than this one. So I'll factor that in when I'm looking at the supplement. Um, and then other aspects are just sort of um, kind of giving me a little bit more information. So things like the dry matter can give me a better understanding of how well it might ferment. And I've cut off other aspects of the analysis um, in terms of the volatile fatty acids, lactic acid, which just help give an indication as to how well that has, um, how good the fermentation is. But in terms of feed quality, these are the two pieces of information I'm looking at, ME and crude protein. So silage one, um, based on a 10.7 ME, um, that will provide um, a 60 kilo U, uh, 10.2 megajoules of energy up to three weeks. So post three weeks, their intakes start to drop. So it'll provide um, that energy up to three weeks. Um, so, so on that basis and on the calculations and my knowledge of what they require, they will need additional energy from five weeks pre-lamming. Silage 2, on the other hand, will only provide eight megajoules of energy. So not only is it providing less energy density, but they eat less of it. Um, and so they will need additional energy from 10 weeks pre-lamming. So if it's a case of weighing up whether to feed, uh, whether to, which one to save to late pregnancy, silage 1 will be my go there. And I might either use silage 2 earlier on in pregnancy, so three 10 weeks, or I might feed it to another class of stock. Um, and then when I'm getting to, to later on in pregnancy, when I'm starting to feed them that bit more, for the five weeks, the 10 weeks, um, I've just calculated what a 60 kilo single bearing you would require based on this type of um, new role. So 12.5 ME, metabolizable energy, 18% crude protein role. So I can see in silage one, they will require 0.2 kilos per day, and in silage two, they will require double that. Okay, so, so it all puts emphasis again on the highest energy to reduce my dependency on additional concentrate, which as I mentioned last week, come with this um, effect on the Rubin pH, which could be lead to less, um, less digestion of the fiber. Now, many of you picked up on the fact that I didn't discuss protein enough next, last week. So, the role of protein, it has a role in the, the immunity of the sheep. We know that if ewes are um, low in protein, when it comes to them being um, stressed, for instance, a worm challenge, they will produce, they will um, have more eggs in their, worm eggs in their feces. Um, lamb birth weight um, is, could be impacted if they're deficient in protein. The ewe lamb bonding behavior um, could be impacted, which will reduce the, the milking ability and the, the growth of the, the lambs during lactation and the colostrum, um, and which, as we discussed, is all important. But as I always say, you must ensure they have sufficient energy first. And this is why when we're dealing with ruminants, we are working with um, fermentation using rumen bugs. So um, protozoa, yeast and uh, bacteria. And those rumen bugs are great because they convert that protein that they, they eat into a protein that they can utilize for growth, for milk, for wool, as the case may be. Um, so though, those rumen bugs will take this form of protein, which we call degradable protein, um, and they will convert it in, a, they will utilize energy, they are fueled on energy, and they will convert it into what we call microbial protein. Okay, so that's like I say, it's dependent on energy. If they don't have the energy to do that, then they won't capitalize on this degradable protein. Um, but the other form of protein that we discussed a bit last week was this form called DUP, digestible undegradable protein. And this is a protein that um, is protected from degradation in the rumen and is absorbed in their small intestine. 
So a very common source of this DUP is soya, but um, things like rapeseed meal products or wheat distillers has an element of this DUP. And so we can sometimes um, target this mode of giving them protein provided we've got enough of the degradable stuff too. Um, and and um, providing we've got um, enough energy, we can be quite targeted and give them um, some soya or give them some uh, rapeseed meal to give them that bit of boost to prevent that decline in their immunity so much to help provide um, that colostrum production and the ELAM bonding as I've just described. So, so that's just a bit of an understanding of protein types and, and things to look for to, um, to potentially, if you're concerned about them, to give them that bit boost. But I will say that if they're in good condition at lambing time, we've seen less uh, benefit of this DUP effect. Now, I just wanted to discuss things to look for when it comes to um, deciding on a compound to supplement their feed with. Um, often this is the sort of information that we're given. So product one, it'll talk, it'll give you the information that um, is le they're legally obliged to give. So oil, fiber, ash, and protein percentage. Um, so to start with, my main sort of thing is looking at the fiber. So fiber, yes, it's good for rumen health, but it can be indicative of a, a lower energy feed. So that's a bit of information for me there. Um, and then I would look down the ingredient list. And um, the ingredient list is often listed in order, well, it is listed, sorry, in order of inclusion. And when I look down the ingredient list, things that I, I like to see are wheat, that's a high ME feed, barley, wheat distillers, sugar beet, um, and maize. So those are good ingredients. These are high energy ingredients. And then on the protein side, the high pro soya, the soya in there too. Things I don't want to see high up on the list of ingredients are these things. So wheat feed, uh, palm kernels, sunflower, oat feed. Um, yeah, so these ingredients are, are lower in energy and they're still quite high. They're still quite starchy ingredients. So if they're high up on the list, that's indicative of a lower energy feed. Um, now you might go and ask, ask the, merchant, uh, the merchant on what the ME value is of that feed. And I, I, rec I recommend that you do so because that really does influence how much that product is worth. So for instance, that product one I just described is 330 pounds a ton. Um, if, I, if that's an 11 and a half ME feed, that's 3.3 pence per megajoule of energy, okay? And I've just, showed the maths down the bottom here. So you, you first convert it into the dry matter, pounds per tonne of dry matter, um, and then converting it to pence per kilo of dry matter, and then dividing that by 11 and a half ME gets me my price per megajoule of energy. My second product is 350 pounds a tonne. Is it worth it? Well, I'm told that this is a 13 ME feed. So, um, Working on this maths again, that's 3.1 pence per megajoule of energy. So per megajoule of energy, it is cheaper. Um, and working this if it, uh, at 3.1 pence per megajoule of energy, working this back to an 11.5 ME feed, this one would have to be £3.10 per tonne to be um, of equivalent um, um, price per megajoule of energy. But you'd need to feed more of it, and therefore needing, feeding more of it leads to potential issues with that room in pH. So, so yeah, just be aware of false economies and look at the quality of the feeds before deciding on whether to purchase them. Um, often energy buckets and licks are really useful in the hill situation, um, but the same rules do apply. So look at the ingredients, look at the quality of them. And, and really they're designed to complement grass, not replace it. So often these, these buckets will only provide, um, the energy buckets will only provide one to two megajoules of energy. And well, another 60 kilo U will require 16 megajoules of energy pre-lamming. So, so they don't, they supplement grass, they can help act as a bit of an insurance, um, 
but it's a really um, expensive and challenging way to, to meet the majority of their energy requirements. They are different to mineral blocks. Minerals are designed, blocks are designed purely for that purpose. Um, and you can get sheep are so individual, you will get variable intakes. It's a really tricky way to try and get consistency there. Um, and then there are some that have been designed for complementing, uh, you know, for specific purposes, such as complementing forage crops and an interlactation as well. Okay. And then licks like these sort of molasses type feeders, they can be useful if you're particularly concerned about things like twin lamb disease. Um, if, if, for instance, um, the ewes are in poor condition, then they can again act as a bit of, a, a bit of insurance as well. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on trace elements. There is a fact sheet, a FAS fact sheet um, on trace elements in sheep. And I've just taken this table from it, which illustrates for the four main trace elements and um, what sort of influence from high to moderate possible influence on these key issues. So you can see straight away um, the effects of copper deficiency, cobalt deficiency, selenium deficiency, and iodine deficiency. But as I always say, you must collect evidence to check for deficiency first. Getting blood tests, getting tissues such as um, a liver tissues tested, grass and soil as well. But none of these, um, I mean, bloods and tissues are more accurate than grass and soil, but they all do help build up a picture to understand whether um, supplementation is necessary. Um, from this fact sheet, uh, cobalt, there's a bit of information, but I'm just highlighting younger sheep are more susceptible due to the higher energy demands. There's this map of Scotland, which illustrates the risk of cobalt deficiency quite a lot in red there. Um, and like grass management factors that can also um, exacerbate deficiency are things like high pH rainfall and high grass growth. Selenium can be seen with these sort of stiff lamb disease and poor reproductive performance. So it's worth checking on that pre-tuffing time. Uh, copper, often seen as sway back, but you've got to be um, conscientious of potential copper toxicity. Copper is a challenging one because it is um, influenced by levels of molybdenum and sulfur in the soil. So these can bind and lock up copper and make it less available. So when you get in a soil analysis done, if, you, if so looking at these other elements and also when you're supplementing them, you're better um, supplementing the animal rather than the soil or the forage. Um, iodine can be seen as uh, late, so still uh, late abortions um, or weak lambs, and it uh, can be seen on things like forage crops as well as the like, enlarged thyroid gland, gland. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention vitamin E um, because it's poorly stored compared to the other vitamins and it has been linked to lamb bigger, and therefore, if feeding in late pregnancy, it's recommended vitamin E is supplemented. Um, and with all these things, it's all very well throwing them at it, but there are risks with over supplementing too, as we saw on this farm. Um, so this farmer was providing a, a bolus, um, which was lasting um, six months. So this bolus was providing the red line level of iodine provision. But then the farm was also providing a mineral in their feed in late pregnancy which put them in this zone of high iodine toxicity risk. And the problem with that is that leads to poor colostrum absorption in the lambs. So um, making, and my first point of advice would be only provide mineral from one source. Often these minerals are designed to give them no more, than, uh, designed not to um, present a toxicity risk. So thank you very much. I guess my summary is condition score, condition score, condition score. It's always a link to um, so much research has linked it to better crop performance. Um, always question your system. Are there other wintering opportunities available to prevent that over overgrazing of grass and give you more control of condition in uh, mid-pregnancy um, and help you utilize quality forage? Beware of false economies and, and watch out build evidence to understand trace element deficiencies on your farm.
Fantastic, Poppy. A huge amount of information in a very, very short space of time. Uh, there's actually quite a lot of questions have come through for you, but we will just leave them till the end. So thank you, Poppy. Plenty of food for thought for people there. Um, really maximise the use of forage, and especially in a year like this when your concentrates are so expensive. So some really, really good pointers there from Poppy. Next, we're going to move on to the famous Bobby Lennox. Um, Bobby, if you want to share your screen just now. So those who don't know Bobby, Bobby is a fantastic um, ambassador, really, for Scottish agriculture. He promotes food and farming, and at the same time, he is an excellent, efficient farmer who really maximises the use of genetics. So Bobby, over to you. Right, thanks very much, Kirsten, for introduction. I think you may have been reading something, but I don't, didn't, didn't recognise myself there when you said. But no, I'm very pleased to have been asked to come and do this talk and tell us a little bit about what we do here at Shantron and Shimoor. This is us. Uh, my daughter and son in law have just come into the partnership about a year ago, they're back home now and you'll hear more about what they're sort of doing to for succession and keeping going but that's the four of us are now working the farm at various degrees of activity on the farm and various other activities as well this is a farm it's not gave you an idea scale it's five miles from there to there from the head of the glen down to the shores of Loch Lomond it's a steep-sided glen, finless, and we've got both sides of it and a couple of wings sticking out the side. Uh, that's really looking up the glen. Uh, Shimor's there, and this is Shantron here, so they're quite close together, but that river that runs up the middle is only passable in one or two spots. It's not, it's very deep, 100 foot drops right down this bit here. Uh, Turning around the other way, looking down there, again, Shantra and Shimor, looking out over the loch. We used to have this land, was a, that was our best land in the farm, with 130 acres down here, and we lost that a couple of years ago, when it went, went back to the golf course, so they, they, they were the owners of it. Uh, so we lost that, unfortunately, and that's made some changes to the number of stock we can carry and the way we run the business. Some facts and figures about the farm, it's 4,000 acres, goes from 20 feet up to just over two and a quarter thousand feet. Rainfall is now between 90 and 110 inches. When I started farming and all through my father's life, it was a steady 70 inches plus or minus five or six. We've been tenants in the farm since 1750. K is now the 11th generation on the lease. And we don't have any full-time labor on the farm or what with a local contract shepherd for the days we need to gather the hills we get them in for that and it also comes in over lambing time running mainly 1100 ewes pretty well all black face or seven eighths black face now we had a cross flock that was ran in that ground down below the main road there that i've said we lost so that they've been getting bred back to the black face and are running with the blackies on the hill we run, run between 20 and 25 suckle cows all out wintered and deferred grazing and a little bit of cobs. All the lambs are sold prime, uh, basically to Marks and Spencers, uh, and calves are sold store at 15 months. Now, a little video here that our grandkids did for QMS last year for some competition that the QMS were running. So I'll just play it because they describe the farm quite well. Everybody. My name is Elsa and I am seven. Hi everyone, my name is Blair and I am eight. This is our farm and it is 5,000 acres and it's called Chantron and Shamor Farm. We have 25 cows. 1,100 blackfish sheep, but this isn't all of them here all year round except at lambing time. During the season we gather the hills. Grandpa gets to go on a bike because he gets to cover a larger area. Today we are gathering for lambing. The lambing shed at Thank you. 
Right. Thing that we did do differently from what most hill farms do is way back in 1979, I won a young farmer's six month trip to New Zealand and they were just developing the easy care system out there and I came back with quite a few of the ideas from that. So we selected, started selecting for easy care, easy learning traits back in 79. There's a very simple system of if anything was wrong, we put different cut shaped notches in the ear tags that we had put in the sheep at that time uh, and could cull accordingly. We started seriously recording with Signet in 1989. We started back fat scanning in 1990. And at that time, uh, you got your Signet records back, you get your back fat scan records. They weren't interlinked, they weren't really talking to one another. So you look at two sheets of paper and pick which views you wanted, depending on both the figures and the back fat scan. It's an awful lot easier to do now. Uh, in 1993, four of us got together in the Blackie Weed and started sci referencing, and then that number increased up to about, I think at the peak, there would have been 15 or 16 uh, between here and Northern Ireland, all sci referencing. Unfortunately, the numbers have dropped back a bit now as they've really gone out of sheep farming or they've changed breeds. And we record about 400 ewes uh, and they're in the recorded flock and then we've got the commercial flock out with that and all the rams are bred in the recorded flock and then get used out onto the commercial flock. Uh, they're all run together. They don't, the recorded flock don't, doesn't get it's any separate treatment. They're just managed exactly the same as if they were the commercial flock. Some of the improvements that we've gained over the years are that uh, goes up to 2016. Just after that, the index changed and it was all rebased. So that the gap that had done dropped to the bottom and started again. But that was the last figures that when I did a right check. So you see that's the scan weight's gone up by about three and a half kilograms in weight from what it was when it started. The eight week weight has gone up by nearly two kilograms, just over two kilograms. It's now up nearly at three kilograms, actually, of extra weight. Litter size, maternal will. I am trying to keep the litter size down. I deselect uh, for highly prolific sheep because I don't want a lot of twins on the hill, uh, but it still keeps going up. Uh, and the maternal ability uh, is is going up, and that, that's 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 one of the figures I want. I want a good maternal ability figure. Big big difference here in the muscle depth. We've put a lot of extra muscle onto the when you back fat scan, you measure the jig across the the the, the chop, uh, and we've managed a lot of muscle on that without increasing the fat levels terribly much at all. That's just our overall index where we are and where the breed average is. So we're, we're, we're reasonably well above the breed average. And uh, not just overall index, but in actually each of the traits that we measure uh, is above the breed average. And you can see the traits that I don't, I don't pay any attention to the, the fat level indexes. And I'm trying to keep the litter size small, so I haven't had growth in them. But I've had growth in eight week weight, I want, I want scan weight, I want muscle depth and maternal ability. So they're improving. Uh, mature size I'd rather keep down. I like to keep my ewes in around 48, 50 kilograms. I don't want them much bigger than, than that. But as you prove everything else, this one creeps along and very seldom do you find a sheep that has got a 
small mature size, but all the other figures are good. They're very unusual to come across them. The important thing is, and this is it's an old slide I've used, uh, if I go back to 92, 93, when we started doing the SI referencing, we were still selling all our arms prime at that stage. Half of them were O grade and the average weight was 15 and a half kilos. Within five years of SI referencing, we put over two kilos of carcass weight onto them and dropped the number of O grades down to 15%. Another five years later, we'd dropped the O's a little bit more, but we were starting to get much more U's and even the odd E in vacuum lambs and up to 18 and a half or just over 18 kilos. We're now averaging the last two years, we've been averaging about 19, 19 and a half kilo carcasses. I very seldom see an O grade now. I haven't seen an E grade for two or three years, admittedly, but the other percentages are, are much the same. That's just some of the use. We don't pay much attention to what they're looking like. I don't follow the fashions. Uh, I, I want sheep that are going to work. Whether they look pretty or not doesn't worry me in the slightest. Uh, that's some of the shielding rams that we had for sale. Uh, I usually sell about 10 or so a year, all sold privately off the farm. Uh, quite a lot going down into Devon, Cornwall, down into that area. Some used to go to Northern Ireland, but it's been too difficult to export them. They are now, uh, and there's quite a few go out to the islands. And a lot of the buyers now just buy them on the figures that I send them. They don't even look at the sheep. They, they take them on the figures. They've learned to trust the figures on what they'll, how, they'll, how they'll do. Uh, but we're really, the main thing that we've been able to do is the sheep lamb themselves. We'll lamb 800 sheep we can lamb inside. And if we've got to pull into double figures of pulling lambs, would be unusual over the year out of the 800 ewes that are housed. Uh, so they really got on themselves as singles. Uh, used to be left and out in the hill to lamb, but there's, the foxes are not getting kept under control so much, and the badgers, you can't do anything about them. Uh, and they're becoming a bigger problem. So we don't lamb out in the hill now, we just lamb in the hill parks. But the, the singles are left to get on with it themselves. There's nobody going round them maybe once or two or three times a day. Uh, now Kay's got a drone. She actually just flies around these fields very quickly. In five, 10 minutes will cover all the hill parks. Just give them a check, make sure there isn't any problem or there any de no dead lambs lying there because the fox has been working. Um, It's a short video that was taken when we were in the, the This Farming Life series way six or seven years ago now since it was filmed. I got some of the video footage, so I'll just quickly run through a little bit of this. Uh, that's Shantron Farm there. Again, look into Shantron. This is into Shimore now. There, just gather new hogs in there. This reservoir is exactly in the middle of the farm, it's two and a half miles to the head of the glen from there, two and a half miles back to Lost Shore. This is just going into the, one of the lambing sheds. At this point in time, this is the winter with the fattening lambs in here. Let's stop it there at the moment. If you can see the feeding comes, we've got a tower bin there. That's an auger feed system that runs that orange pipe and it drops down by gravity into each of the feeders. So you have three or four feeders in this shed. Uh, and when the last bin's filled, it automatically switches off. So we've got that both in this shed and the polytunnel up there, uh, we do the same in it. So we, we, at one time we were fattening a thousand lambs between the two sheds, uh, but that was when we did over two and a half thousand views of the farm. We've cut the numbers back now, but we're still fattening 
about six, seven hundred lambs through these sheds. And then this shed converts up into the lambing shed the time all these lambs have gone. In the middle of March, we'll have converted it back for lambing. The things that we do to try and get as many lambs as possible out of the ewes is we wean early. Uh, we wean the first week in August, which I think is 12, 13 weeks old. We start lambing around about the 20th of April, so you can do the sums yourselves. There's basically 12 weeks we'll wean at, and that gives the ewe a chance, and most of them reach condition three by topping time. We only give them 21 days with a ram, so that the tops go out round about 28th November, 1st of December, and the ewes are all the way back to the hill. Uh, they're all in by mated in fields or hill parks, and the ewes go back to the hill before Christmas. So it's a very tight period. Fairly hard culling, we, we work with soft tags in the ears. Uh, if a lamb, you needs assistance at lambing time, she's notched. There's a notch put in our you lamb, so they don't keep it for breeding as well. Uh, if there's any bad foot rot for some reason, they'll notch the tag. A different shape notch for different things. If they're scanned empty, they're notched. If they've had a lamb and lose it, they're notched uh, and they're culled. If, if it's a gimmer, it'll get a second chance in the commercial herd. It won't stay in the recorded flock. Scanning was probably the biggest breakthrough that we had in farming in the early 80s. Uh, and that made a big difference to the way we could manage the ewes. When we were out running about 20 to 25% of the ewes carrying twins, and we were only feeding for uh, big singles, uh, being able to separate the twins out, feed them properly, made a big difference to lamb survival. We basically work at scanning time, which we'll be scanning uh, the end of next week, hopefully, if we can get the sheep gathered off the hills. Uh, we'll be managing them once they're scanned. Twins go into the hill park and get onto silage, depending on the analysis of the silage, uh, whether it's a 16% protein or an 18% protein they get at that point in time. We always switch up to an 18% uh, good quality cake uh, in the last three weeks uh, before lambing time. Uh, lean singles are also kept in, uh, and the twins, the singles themselves, just go back to the hill. Uh, we house the use basically end of March. We gather them all in to get a flute dose. Uh, they get treated for ticks because uh, tick is a big problem here. They're treated for ticks, and they get their head to back pre vaccination. And at that point, uh, all the twins go into the sheds. All the leaner singles, or leaner than I would like, go into the sheds. And we put in all the recorded ewes, whether they're single or twins, into the shed. Purely, it speeds up the process of tagging lambs at birth, if it, rather than have to do it around the fields and catching lambs outside. Uh, we just do it in the shed, and, and we go out. Uh, with three sheds working at the lambing, one at Shanton, the two at Shemoor. There's usually somebody goes out in the morning. Uh, you, over, it's usually Anne goes out and looks at the lambing shed round about half six in the morning. Here, puts any newborn lambs into individual pens, uh, make sure everything else is all right. Um, at the start of lambing, I'll be out at eight o'clock. By the end of lambing, uh, it'll probably be near nine before I waken up. Uh, but I, I go on uh, and do the night or the evening through to about one o'clock, two o'clock. I usually start to go out to the sheds about one o'clock and uh, hopefully in by two uh, and do that. Uh, there's no one in the sheds from two o'clock through to six o'clock. Uh, last year, we put cameras in each of the sheds and that made a big difference because uh, it meant you could, one person could do all the sheds at night, it didn't mean need somebody at Shemore and somebody at Shantrum. So that helped for the amount of sleep that we we're all able to get. Uh, and as I said, Kay uses a drone. She can shoot around the, the hill parks where there's singles, give them a check. It's also very, very handy at topping time when we've got 
single single sire of mating, so we might have 10 or a dozen different fields with 30, 40, 50 ewes uh, and a, a, a ram in that. So very quickly to check the fields, they don't shoot the tops there, make sure there's nothing got into the wrong field. They're all well color marked so that we know which field they belong to. Uh, and what used to take me over an hour to do with the quad bikes, you can do in 10 minutes with a drone. It's also very handy if your cow's calving out in the hill and you can't find it, you can very quickly shoot over the hill park with a drone and find, find a missing cow. The other thing that we're doing, we've involved uh, for four or five years with Numb Nuts, trialing the various different versions of it. And we are very, very pleased using Numb Nuts. We mark all the lambs, uh, literally the, the oldest we sit, so it's 20 days and the youngest will be three or four days old. Basically, as soon as lambing's finished or slowed down, uh, we start marking lambs early. We use the Numb Nuts and don't have any problem with lambs lying around not wanting to follow their mother or anything like that. So I'm well pleased with that and I'll I'll keep using it as long as I, I can get get the anaesthetic and that that's giving them problems at the moment over here. Uh, just conscious of the time, I think that's enough said about that. Any questions can come along afterwards. This is a Best bit of equipment that we've, we've bought recently is a, it's a combi clamp, but it's mounted in a trailer. So we can use it in any of the sheds. We've got raceways set up in each of the farms. You just back the trailer in, stick it in, ready to go. We can also uh, take it uh, and set it up on different layouts. It's set up at Shantra, different this yard there. Uh, and if I've got hogs away wintering or fattening lambs away at grass, that's just backpacks kind of through the tops through it, no bother. We also got full cast you put the tops through it, yep, no bother. And this is us taking it away with lambs away grazing. So if we need to go down and handle them, do feet or drench them, it's very easy to take the bank with us. No, so just set up it's the, the yardage kind of behind it we've put in and then that's so it's, you know, the, the scanners come in and hook on to the end of it. That's a shearing boys and they hook on to the end of it. So it works well. And that's one of the old double dose of graces that we, we still use occasionally. Another thing that we, we do, I, I reckon our type of farm could lose 50% of the subsidies that we get at the moment in the near future. So we really kind of look out of ways of raising that sort of money to be able to keep us on farming viably. Uh, so we do agritourism, we do lambing species, and that's one other big advantage of the shed. I can make about 10,000 pounds over two weeks, taking folk around the lambing shed, watching lambing. Uh, we do quad bike trailer tours. We take them around the, the farm and different tours. We'll take bus tours in. And a popular one is folk will pay me a hundred pound to come and work beside me for a day. Uh, it can be very helpful at times, sometimes the hindrance, uh, but as a whole, it's, it's a very interesting life. And I think it's great being able to impart what farming is really like to somebody that has no idea about it at all. And I think that's very, very valuable. Just some of the cattle out and the deferred grazing out in the hill in the winter. That's some old photographs of the fattening lambs inside the shed and polytunnel. There's a good idea. You can see the, the feed pipe there filling up the different offers and finish up with what it can be like here in the winter time. And I think that's me finished and hopefully not overrun too long. Brilliant. Thank you, Bobby. Again, so much covered in such a little time. Um, next up, we have got Davy, and again, there's plenty of questions coming for Bobby. We will hear from Davy, and then we'll we'll give Bobby his questions. Um, as I said at the start, Davy is standing in for Fiona. Uh, Fiona has been doing work or just starting her PhD, or she's halfway through. Sorry, Davy, isn't she? Her PhD on um, lamb losses on hill farms. So Davy's going to stand in this evening. He is the head of department for integrated land management. And he is also the head of the Hill and Mountain Research Centre um, for SRUC. So a great stand-in man for this evening. Davy, over to yourself. 
No worries, Kirsten. Thank you. And, and leave the praise until after the presentation. Can I just check that you can see the presentation now and hear me okay? Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for that. As I say, apologies. Um, Fiona, I've been called away unexpectedly. I'll hopefully try and do justice to what she was intending to actually say tonight. <clears throat> just to start off by saying um, this is a, a, a very much a collaborative PhD that Fiona is conducting between SRUC, the University of Edinburgh and, and Nature Scott. And you can hopefully see there um, the large number of supervisors that um, uh, are helping Fiona um, with this work. So basically, she's looking at black loss and we'll talk a bit more about black loss as we go through the presentation, looking to define more accurately what is meant by the term. Um, particularly look to under, uh, identify what are the underlying factors leading to black loss and, and potentially what can be done about it. And also um, seeking to quantify, if possible, the part that sea eagles may play in some um, of those losses in some parts of Scotland. Um, Fiona started off her, her PhD um, um, questioning it out to farmers. So this year, I'm not going to read all of these. Uh, it's just these were some of the um, comments that were coming back from farmers or questions coming back from farmers when they were asked, in their opinion, what is black loss on their hill farm or croft? And she was targeting hill farms and croft in the sort of the, the, the Western Highlands, which is where um, black loss as, a, as, as an issue is um, uh, known to actually occur. Um, but basically unexplained losses, unaccounted losses, um, mysterious losses, nothing found dead, no idea what's happened, happened to the lambs. And particularly, uh, but not exclusively, between the marking period and the clipping period at the end of July, i.e. when you know that the lambs have been up and about and actually quite um, happy, um, not, not dying immediately after lambing, but they've been able to come in and be marked. Um, and then that's the sort of the key period after marking and through to clipping when many sort of, of these unexplained losses are actually occurring. In terms of the severity, and I'll come back to that in terms of other information and severity, this is just from some of the respondents that she um, got from her questionnaire at the start, then um, many people saying losing between one to 10% of the lambs between marking and weaning, uh, and that's quite a large 10% on itself is quite a large loss. Um, and there was one of those 23 respondents um, reporting a consistently high loss of about over 30% between that same sort of time frame during the sort of lambing season. So uh, no matter how big the loss, it, it can be a loss to these high hill flocks, um, particularly when you're thinking about putting replacement back into a, a sort of hefted system, a system where you need to put female lambs back up into uh, a, a hill or a mountainside that they actually are, are familiar with um, from birth. Um, I'm not going to go through all the questionnaire, but she highlighted um, in the questionnaire that, you know, many of the respondents really did feel that black loss was an inevitable part of hill sheep farming um, in hill sheep, uh, in hill farms and crofts in the sort of the, the, the highlands, but also that actually knowing about, knowing more about what might be actually affecting it uh, or um, impacting on it would be actually helpful to know, um, and particularly um, most of the respondents were very keen to know how to reduce black loss if it was something that was in, in within their control. Uh, and as always with the sort of the black loss um, story, then predation and, and predator risk was um, considered to be a high threat to, to lambs in these sort of extensively grazed um, areas. And so, as I said, Fiona is looking at these unexplained losses. She's focusing on between marking and weaning. So um, those of you unfamiliar with hill sheep systems, that's between um, lambs between six and eight weeks of age through to, being to, four, to four to six months of age. I mentioned earlier, uh, it's the limited amount of work that's been done on this before, Sue Tung, um, reported on a, a study um, back in 2016, um, highlighting that um, an average marking to wean black loss on some of the study farms in Northwest Scotland was about 18% um, 18, 18 um, with the range going from 8% in some years to 23% in, 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 on some farms in other years, which um, is, is, is a high loss for any um, lambing um, farming system to actually be, uh, to bear. But the big issue and the focus of what I'll be highlighting as we go through the presentation or go through Fiona's presentation is it's unclear um, when 
actually when these lambs are disappearing, where they're disappearing, why they're disappearing, and that leads to a lot of uncertainty and uh, about what the causes might be and what the remedial action might be. And so that's part and parcel of um, Fiona's PhD. And as, as any sort of PhD is concerned, she, she's coming at it from the point of view as there's a wide range of potential factors um, out there that um, could influence sort of lamb losses. That could be, we've already heard um, Poppy talk about trace element deficiencies, um, could be high parasite burdens, it could be plocty, yellowsies, that's a, a condition um, associated with um, some of the um, vegetation um, in the grazing areas for um, these using their lambs, uh, and predation um, as well. But also um, other factors in terms of the sort of use, the individual you condition, um, effective weather, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's a wide range of possibilities out there. Um, and it's likely that it'll be a combination of these factors that's causing black loss. And it might even be a different combination that's causing black loss in, on different farms or in different crops. And part of what uh, Fiona's trying to do is just tease out um, ideally what is the causes of black loss. Um, but even if we can't um, uh, discover the smoking gun um, in entirety, maybe actually um, help to identify some of these perceived factors um, that may be less of a, a, an issue um, in, in some areas um, than in others. Um, and so, uh, you know, predators can and will take um, healthy lambs. Uh, they'll take lambs that are suffering underlying sort of health conditions. So it's, it's knowing um, what your um, flock health, flock condition is like, uh, and being able to sort of see if it's possible, and knowing what, you, knowing what your predation risk is, and then seeing if it's actually possible to actually improve health condition and or reduce predation risk. So um, if, it's, if you're subject to uh, predation by foxes and crows, then it's possible to actually legally control those. If it's other protected predators such as ravens or black back gulls, it's um, and, and it's severe enough, then it's potentially possible to get a license from Nature Scott. Um, and sea eagles is a is a is a, is a major issue um, in the farming industry um, at the minute, uh, and there's a lot of work going into sea eagle management schemes in various parts of the Highlands. Um, and through those schemes, there's uh, the ability to apply for sort of support. And to help prevent or reduce the impact of sea eagles where they are um, known to be taking lambs. In um, Fiona's questionnaire, she, she basically asked um, for perceptions, attitudes, um, knowledge of what might be um, predators that were, were of major issues. And for lambs that were less than 10 days old, it was particularly ravens, crows and gulls that were perceived to have the greatest impact on those. And then when looking at lambs that were um, more than 10 days old, then sea eagles, foxes and ravens again were perceived to have the greatest impact on, on that sort of age group. And so those were the, uh, an indication of the sort of the range of perceptions um, and out there and uh, within the sort of relatively small sample size that she was actually um, looking at. And she was particularly keen to, to highlight in the presentation that, you know, getting up a, a clearer indication between whether something's been protected or whether it's been scavenged can actually help um, uh, individual farmers and crofters understand a bit more about what might actually be happening um, on their um, on their farms of crofts. So if someone is um, unlucky enough but actually lucky to find a, a carcass, a complete carcass, then an examination of that can give you some idea as to what might have actually happened or, or, or caused the death. So, you know, if the lambs never walked, you know, it's likely to have been stillborn. Uh, but you cut a piece out of their lung and it sinks, and again, it's likely to be stillborn. And even if it's got uh, puncture marks or bite marks on it, if there's no fresh blood or bruising um, around those pu puncture marks, then it's likely to be scavenged. But if there is fresh blood or bruising, then it's likely to have been predated or at least attacked in some sort of shape or form. Uh, but um, as those of you and Nicole who are um, hill farmers and potentially and crofters and potentially also suffering from black loss, it is extraordinarily rare to find an intact carcass. But there's other clues that you can actually use to try and gain some indication as to what might have happened and, and, and who might have been responsible. So wool pluckings, you know, on a hummock um, or a prominent rock, they generally indicate that the lamb was lifted um, by uh, an eagle and it's been taken to a sort of a plucking post. 
if the thyroid carcass has been dismembered, then that's more likely to have been foxes or badgers that have been actually moving and breaking up the carcass. Um, and if you find a carcass that's in the tongue, the eyes, the anus, sort of pecked at, then corvids and gulls are more likely to have been first to actually get to them to actually do you know, either some of the primary um, damage or, or at least sort of scavenging them. And even um, knowing where or where the carcass uh, is, has been found can actually help um, think through what may have actually happened. So if the carcass is found in cover, then it may be that the lamb was suffering from severe fly strike or severe plocti, yellowsies, and it's gone there to actually um, and seek, some, seek some shelter and then subsequently died of, the, of, of those uh, individual sort of conditions. And so actually um, recording any carcasses that you actually find on the hill, no matter what state they're actually in, um, and keeping a record of that can then help start to sort of build up a, 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 a feel for what may or may not be actually happening um, um, on your individual sort of situation. It's even rarer. It's ra rare to find um, carcasses um, out in the hill. It's even rarer to actually find carcasses that are still in a state that can then be sent off for um, post-mortem. Um, and so within, um, uh, from the seagull management data between 2010 and 2019, a, a nine-year period, there was only 23 carcasses that were actually submitted uh, or found in a condition that could be submitted for, 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 for PMs. The pie chart down the bottom there um, um, indicates that um, eagles, white eagle, eagles, foxes in particular, um, were um, deemed to be responsible for sort of half um, of those losses. Um, but um, Fiona also wanted to highlight in the bullet points on the left hand side there that um, some of those lambs um, that uh, were associated with some form of predation event or scavenging, scavenging event uh, were also um, found at post-mortem to the underlying conditions, whether they were suffering from joint ill or low levels of selenium or whether they had trace element deficiency um, or cobalt and um, copper deficiency or, or dying from hypothermia. Um, and, and so it's just to highlight what I said at the beginning, a likely sort of combination um, of things um, leading to uh, why an individual lamb may be um, scavenged or, or, or predated um, uh, can uh, uh, be important to try and sort of tease out what may actually be happening. And uh, Bobby mentioned um, scanning and started scanning in the 1980s. Uh, and certainly scanning is very important to give you a, a good indication, not only of how many lambs you might be expecting from a particular flock or a particular heft or, or part of your flock, but also allows you to sort of make um, management decisions to put and um, um, use carrying different lambs, um, different parts of the farm or, or, or feed and or feed them, feed them differently. Um, not from solely from um, Fiona's questionnaire, but from a sort of wider uh, data set that she has actually um, access to. Um, there's something like only only about you know fifty to sixty percent of hill farms and crofts in the sort of the, the West Highlands actually scan. And so, if everybody was able to able to actually scan, it would good, give them a, a good idea as to what um, the starting point might be, um, a baseline from which to then judge what level of losses was actually happening, and then and when and where those losses may have been actually happening through, throughout throughout the year. And then the, the next few slides are just a series of, at the main sheep handling events, um, uh, the type of information that um, Fiona is looking to source from a small number of focus farms that, that, that she's actually using um, and to, to get information from. It's, you know, not just the number of lambs that were, that were born, but how many were found dead, what was the cause of death on them. Where possible, tagging um, soon after a lambing, you can then follow individual lamb um, health issues all, all through the sort of season, but that's not always possible in the vast majority of health farming and crofting situations. But even at the main handling events, whether it's marking, whether it's clipping again, knowing how many lambs are coming in, knowing the condition of the lambs that are coming in and the condition in which they're going back out, particularly in terms of any additional health issues like um, ticks, worms, and um, any visible signs of um, um, yellowsies, plocti, and, and keeping some track of that, and then what might have happened to um, a lamb that had a looked like a a, a low case of um, any of ticks or, or plocti, and when it came in at marking, does it actually return um, at clipping, or does it return between clipping and weaning? 
keeping these sort of basic um, records for your own flocks can actually then help um, build up a picture of uh, what may be actually happening um, within your flock when it's out in the hill and you can't you can't actually see see it. And then um, both Bobby and um, um, Poppy also mentioned getting some indication of the general health status of your flock, whether it's looking at uh, blood testing your ewes or, or blood testing your lambs and post weaning, just to get some feel for um, what the general health um, of the the key elements you use and and your and the subsequent lambs that they're actually producing um, has been during that particular season might be one element of actually explaining uh, or helping to explain what may be happening um, and if everything else is 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 um, all else being equal good health condition in the flock, good health condition in the lambs, good, um, uh, reasonably good weather for that particular time of year, et cetera, et cetera. All that can lead to actually suggesting, well, it's not the, it's not an ill health issue. Um, it may be a, a predation issue or, or, or some other issue that's out with um, an individual, excuse me, and farmer or crofter's control. So really, um, Piona, she's only halfway through her, through her, her PhD, so we're not able to be presenting any major results. And um, as yet, that will be another year to 18 months before we can actually do that. But the type of information that um, I flagged on her behalf here and, and, and is listed um, in, um, on this slide here, that's the type of information that if, if, if more farms and crofts had, had some idea of that, it would actually help um, um, Fiona and others try to actually help the farmer and individual health farmer and crofter understand what may be actually happening um, on their farms and more importantly where um, uh, and what type of actions they may be able to actually take to either prevent losses or at least mitigate reduce the number of losses that's actually feasible um, and again just in our, in our contacts with with health farmers and crofters there's a lot of um, support for trying to for her trying to find out a bit more about what is causing the losses but more importantly what what that then might mean um, for an individual farmer and crofter um, what, the, what they could do to actually uh, mitigate reduce those losses because if we want to have actually have viable um, uh, hill sheep and crofting systems um, in the highlands of Scotland then we need to actually ensure they, 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 they can actually um, produce be producing a, a viable um, lamb crop um, year on year and have a viable number of um, uh, new lambs to go back into the, the, the hefted um, system. So that was a very quick run through, Kirsten, just some acknowledgements there um, of what I've already said about uh, where the collaborations are coming from. Uh, so I hope I have done, oops, sorry, I hope I have done um, a you know, some justice in that very quick romp through um, of what uh, I took from the slides I was given um, a couple of hours ago that she was wanting to actually impart to you this evening. It's never easy doing somebody else's presentation, Davey, and I think you've just done it like an absolute pro, so uh, well done. <laughs> that was that was really, really good. So there's been a lot of questions coming, as as always with these. Um, I'm going to go to Bobby first, just following on from Davy's Davy's talk there about black loss, and you're obviously housing your yows because of black loss, and um, when you saw the kind of results from the questionnaire of Fiona's there, and you saw the main main reasons or the main kind of sea eagles, foxes seem to be at the top. Would you agree with that for your situation, or would that be different? Luckily enough, yeah, we have not been bothered by the sea eagle. Uh, there, there have been a couple seen flying around last summer, and the national park are doing everything they can to get them to nest on one of the islands. Um, so we're we'll keep on watching beef and that. Falcons always have been a big problem. I know in lots of states themselves, the, the gamekeepers are shooting over 200 to 300 foxes a year just on the estate. So there always has been a big fox problem. Uh, badgers are an increasing problem. And I know we've got several sets now in the farm. Uh, and that that's round about these areas, you, you notice there's been a, they're having an effect. Um, but the, the main reason we're housing was just um, 
better control of what we were doing at lambing time and sheep and watching watching the sheep that can potentially cause problems and leaving the ones alone that aren't going to cause problems and we uh, up, up until a couple of years ago when Kate and Doogie came home, it only really was Anne and me and the contract shepherd helped out. So we were we were running it very much to the skin of our teeth. But, you know, it was working, the system worked well. Uh, but Brilliant. Think, and you're using the drone as well, Bobby. There's been a few questions about the drone. So there was there was somebody asking how, how it works in high winds. Somebody else has asked how many times a day do you do you fly it round? Um, there's quite a lot of interest on on the drone, and I guess the, the there's somebody commenting that the drone probably doesn't answer back like a member of staff, and you don't need to shout at it like a dog. So that sounds. So uh, how do you find it in high winds? High winds. Well, it's Kay that Kay that does the flying of it, and I would say she's walked up to about thirty mile an hour when she can fly it in. If it's gusty, like the weather we've been having this last few weeks, you wouldn't bother putting it up. Uh, but it, as long as the wind's relatively steady, it's good. It, it looks after itself. It, it's very easy to control, and it automatically corrects for the wind. Uh, so that's never really been a problem. But you know, you don't. We don't like to put out on very wet days. It doesn't like rain or a lot of rain. You know, right windy weather. We don't fly it then. As far as at lambing time, we'd probably go this round the, the hill parks maybe once every third or fourth day, which is five or six times more than often they were getting looked when we didn't have the drone because we just didn't go near them. We just left them get on with it. Uh, and that was that. Uh, topping time, yet flying it every day, weather permitting to save me run, run, run around the key, run around the quad bike, around the fields. But see, it is a big time saver. And again, it's got advantages there at tupping time, doesn't it? For no stress, there's no there's no disruption to them. There's no dogs going through them. The drones yep. is minimal stress as you can ask for, isn't it? Yeah, we don't we don't go near the the, 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 the using tupping time with dogs. We just just leave them alone. Uh, the drone doesn't interfere them, and you can actually gather the sheep. And it's quite easy to move. If you open the gate, you can work a mob of sheep out with a drone and move it across. Particularly if you're rotational grazing, anyway. And you literally open the gate, they'll just about run through themselves. We just need a drone at the back of them uh, to do that. So it, it, it's got a lot more uses than I thought it would have when she got it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Poppy, there is a question you'd said at the start of your talk, you, you showed the graph about the, the grass and the challenges on hill farms. And just when you were going through that, there was a question came through about what would be the best grass species to sow on a hill farm to aid with either winter grass or early spring grass? Um, often I am advocating um, ryegrass and clover, basically. Uh, they have been developed for um, high yield. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of there have been other species sort of developed, um, I'm trying to think, in terms of earlier growth. Uh, I've just lost it, sorry, but often I'm advocating ryegrass and clover. Excellent. Okay. Davy, I've given you a suitable rest for your voice now, so I'm going to, to yeah, hit on okay. you now. <laughs> um, there, there was a question came in there. I'm actually going to rotate it around the three of you. There was somebody asking what Plochty is. But I'm very aware there's a lot of different names for it. Yeah. Poppy, what would be your name for it? It's the uh, yellow zoo, isn't it? The other name for it. Bobby, yeah. what would you call it? Locally, we call it Plochter. And Davy, you were calling it Plochty. Well, uh, okay, I'm I'm not a Gaelic speaker sort of thing, so <laughs> it's it's, Ga it's Gaelic for big head, swollen head. Um, but also yellow zoo is the more um common name for it. And if you go down to Cumbria, it's called Sot. Um, basically, it's a condition associated with grazing out on mountain grasslands that have got bog asphodel on them, and most mountain grasslands in Scotland and Northern England have bog asphodel. The actual um, mechanism is not known uh, in terms of whether it's the bog asphodel itself or something else around the bog asphodel plant, but basically the animals are ingesting um, a, a toxin that's interfering with liver function. And in severe cases, the animal's liver function is so, so um, um, disrupted that it will actually die. Um, 
what what we are calling plochty plochta um, sort yellows is, is where you actually see see the see the condition um, um, starting to actually um, appear um, on the external of the animal. Basically, the liver function is is disrupted. The chlorophyll that the animal is taking in in the vegetation is not being excreted as it normally would in its um, feces. It's getting into the bloodstream, and basically the chlorophyll starts still acting as uh, as a, as gathering energy from some for sunlight and UV light. So basically, the animal becomes um, hypersensitive to sunlight. Uh, the the wool on its back starts to um, 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 fall off. It gets really like bad cases of. It looks like a, it is a bad case of of sunburn. But if left un, untackled, untreated, then that really debilitates the animal, and they can then die from the chronic um, condition as much as from the, the severe condition. Great explanation. Great explanation. Another one for you, Davy, is you spoke about Fiona's research. Where, what's the kind of geographical location of the farms that she's done the research with? So the survey work, uh, the, survey, the, the questionnaire surveys that were returned, they are drawn from all over, from 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 Argyll, excuse me, through Mull, Sky, West Highlands, etc. But the the focus of what we were, what I was trying to emphasise in the in the presentation, the type of information that's needed to then try to help unpick what might be happening, is. Um, she, her, her work is focused on um, two farms um, in um, uh, Northern Argyll, Mull and a croft in Lochaber, um, where the individual farmers and crofters concerned are already gathering not the full range of information that, 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 that she would need, but more information than, than, than others um, actually have. Um, and, and so uh, we, we focused in on those areas because there was there was a there was an initial context uh, that was that was well known that, she, that then allows her to go in because a PhD is you know four years, actually it's really you know two and a half three years of actual data gathering you know it, it just the, the amount of information that you can actually add to, and um, it's helpful to actually have a wider context there. So so that's where she's where she's focusing in on. But. Um, Nature Scott and uh, are provided some funding, uh, welcome funding, and uh, we're, we're we're closely working with with them and the and, and the, the seagull management schemes. So uh, we are we are drawing additional contextual data from a wider range um, of the highlands and islands. But the, but the sheep the sheep condition data and lamb condition data and lamb loss data is coming from a much smaller um, cohort of of focal farms. Super. Back to yourself, Bobby, you didn't speak about your scanning percentage. What is your scanning percentage? And do you find that that has changed for your performance recording or do you have a optimum that you're aiming for? We're, we're scanning now. She more gen, tends to run around 100 105% scan. Shantan tends to run about 110, 120. Now, way back when we started in the 80s, we were scanning at about 130%. So, I've deliberately tried to bring it down and I've brought it down to a level of size because what we were finding then, if I were in 500 sets of twins on the farm, we'd have worse weaning percentage than it if we had 200 sets of twins in the farm because just, we just, the farm couldn't cope with that number of twins uh, way back then. So we've, we've brought the lambing percentage back down. I really just want one ewe with one lamb would be the ideal, but you never, you never get that. Uh, we, we mark, we reckon we lose about 5% between scanning and marking, but we are marking as young lambs. So it's maybe not comparable to most folks that are marking at six or eight weeks. Uh, and we'll lose between 5 and 10% between marking and uh, weaning on an average year. But I mean, weather can have a big impact on that too. Yeah, and there we've got our, our national kind of average of lamb losses from lambing to rearing or weaning is generally 15%. So you're you're pretty much on, on the ball there, aren't you? There, there was also a comment just when you were talking about your, your offering the, the best of nutrition, Bobby. What, what kind of quantities would you be offering your singles and twins of feed? Singles, if they're fit and healthy, don't see any dry feeding at all. Uh, twins, they're on ad libs. Once they come into the hill part, ad lib silage, and it's a lot more used in the 18 poppy around the, the ring feeder. It's around about one ring feeder to 80 to 100 used we, we put out. 
but the, the, other, the other ad lib silage plus the, the gazing off of the hill park so it's been left empty since tupping time so it, there's not a lot of good grass on it but the roughage there for silage and depending really on the analysis of the silage the, the body condition of the ewe is whether it'll start with a 16 percent cake which i usually do for the first two or three weeks and then i'll move up to an 18 percent cake they're all of poppies type two they're all the ones with wheat barley good they're good it's a good feed i use it's not a not one of the the cheaper versions uh and that seems to do and we're feeding up to the sort of last two weeks before lambing i'll be up to about a pound a head split over two feeds when they're in the shed they feed twice a day and it's about a pound a, a head that they're getting twice a day and that's obviously your twins that's the twins uh, lean singles would be get the same the way we, we, we the pens are all arranged in the shed you start with triplets if there's any in one pen then you've got twins 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 then leaner singles and some twins in that pen and then singles and get fitter and all the, the pens have got blackboards at the end of each feeding passage that you feed half a pail to a quarter of a pail depending what's in them and as the numbers change at lambing time so anyone can go in and feed but all they've got to know is the right amount in relation to the number that's written up in the on the, the board. Excellent. And final question for the night is coming to you, Poppy, and it's somebody asking about forage crops. So we've we've spoken of forage crops tonight, but not in a lot of detail. And they're asking what would be the best choice of forage crops for inland yows pre lambing. Yeah, so I didn't talk too much on this because I appreciate it's not an option for many hill farmers. But um, yeah, I mean, Kirsten, you'll know fodder beet is excellent if you can grow it because it's it'll be the highest energy yield you can get on fodder beet. But you need to make sure you've got the protein there to supplement it. So the leaf there and silage or grazed grass can serve quite well to get that balance. Swedes can do better and. Yeah, things like kale and red kale can also um, be good, but you won't get the same level of stock and density because they don't have the same level of energy yield. So there's 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 a lot of different options there, and I guess the situation of the farm and what it's capable of is a big deciding factor as well as the environment, yeah. isn't it? That's it. For the beet requires quite a lot of agronomy, doesn't it? To, and you need to get that yield for it to be cost effective. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. So just to finish up, we have some ROSA points for this evening. So anybody who is um, a Register of Sheep Advisor um, member, then please just ping me an email with your number, your full name and your postcode, and I will register the points for you. There's two available for this evening's webinar. And just to highlight next week, Wednesday, same time, um, we have got our final one in the series and we'll be looking at outdoor lambing. So you've got the constant of myself, myself and Poppy and we will also have Cathy Dwyer and Neil McGowan join us as well. So um, that will be the, the last one in the series and it will be an excellent event again. So we have covered so much tonight. I am going to put the speakers on the absolute spot and I'm going to start with Poppy tonight. And what is your top take home for our participants this evening? Um, do what you can do, what you can control. And I appreciate hill farming, there's so many challenges, but give them the best chance they can with um, good health and nutrition management. Bobby? I think Make sure you keep the body condition of the you right. That's number one. Uh, if you've got it right, it'll much better chance of coming through the winter, no matter what the weather throws at it. And that, that's been our biggest going from September weaning to early August weaning has made a massive difference to that and the ewe survival over the winter, the death rate and the ewes dropped markedly. Great tip. And finally, Davy. Um, don't assume that. Um, that you think you know what's causing any losses on your farm, you know, it's, if you can get some some data, some data is better than no data, whether it's on health or or, or on predation risk or, or whatever it is. Just don't assume. Get get um, get some um, digging a bit deeper and, and and see what the situation is on your own farm, and you you may be surprised by by what you find. 
Fantastic. Thank you. So three fantastic uh, points there, all from a different angle. Uh, so I hope you've all enjoyed this evening's webinar. We will send round the recording of this so you can listen to it again, as well as a wee survey just to get a bit of feedback from you all. So thank you for joining and hopefully we will see you next week. Thank you.